Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Jason Todd, a self-taught programmer who, before graduating high school, built a computer program for his dad's trucking business, making it among the industry's first to distribute rates in an automated way. By the age of 19, he was fast-tracked for management at a multi-million dollar retailer after proven sales success against larger markets. Since then, he has started numerous multi-million dollar businesses like Alpine Home Air Products and has coached dozens of entrepreneurs. Jason is currently the founder and managing director of Thinker Ventures, which connects aspiring entrepreneurs, small businesses, and mid-marketing executives with education, opportunity, and implementation services across a variety of disciplines. He's also the host of Coffee with Humans, a social experiment where strangers have a few minutes to say hello before going live and having real, raw, and the most random conversations you'll hear on the internet. This is how I met Jason, and the experience was incredible. In this very interesting conversation filled with copious amounts of laughter, we discussed the amazing way his family dealt with internal arguments that set him up for life, and despite this, he still found himself struggling to understand other people. The most important lesson he's learned in life? How he learned to become a salesman? How did he get the idea to start his first company? What was the hardest lesson he learned from starting his first company? And much more. I know you'll love this episode as much as I did, so let's give Jason a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Jason. So before we get into anything specific, why don't you tell everyone who you are, what you do, what you stand for? So who I am, I'm Jason Todd. I am a father. Uh, I am a business owner. I am a uh, social entrepreneur in some ways. I have launched, run, grown, and sold multiple companies. I've advised hundreds or maybe a thousand entrepreneurs at this point in time. Uh, and I am also the host of Coffee with Humans, a global international video cast uh, where I meet a stranger and then an hour later we are friends and the whole thing has been live streamed to the internet. And that's how we met through a platform. I think it's called Audrey. Was that it? Audrey.io? I think it was Audrey. So this platform, Audrey, allows uh, hosts to find guests. And I think you messaged me and I was like, hey, this sounds interesting. And like we went and we did it and it was the most random thing I think I've done in a very long time. And yet it was actually quite fun. So th- thank you for that experience. Well, good. I was glad to have you on. One of my first guests, uh, she had this background. Uh, I thought it was background. She was sitting on what looked to be a boat. And I said, hey, are you, is that a fake background? Everybody uses these fake backgrounds on Zoom calls. And I was thinking, how the hell did you figure out how to do that on StreetYard? And uh, no, she lives on a boat. And uh, so, you know, then all of a sudden her husband came on. It's like, so now I've had a husband and a wife on who both live on a boat in Seattle. Interesting, for sure. Are they the most interesting? No. But but it, from a, from the terms of like living on a boat, yeah, that's pretty darn interesting. <laughs> So I think everybody is interesting in their own right. So what made you want to get into entrepreneurship? I think that it's always been in my blood. I don't know that I knew it could be any different. Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, let's say, or a entrepreneur. My dad started a trucking company a long time ago uh, and maybe 50 years or something like that. And so I grew up in a family of people who just did their thing. They launched, you know, they launched companies and and worked out of them. And so I've always created things. That's, I think that's the basic of it. I got a computer at a young age. I was a self-taught programmer and started writing software. I think out of 
out of that idea of, well, well, if I can create all this stuff, then, you know, it's just a little, it's just a short jump from people wanting to buy it. I never went to school or something like that where somebody's like, hey, you could be an entrepreneur. Uh, I think, you know, they have that right now. You know, you introduce kids to entrepreneurship. Well, I was introduced to it already. I, I didn't know I couldn't. So did you ever have a role in your father's business? Yeah, I did at one point in time. <laughs> I and and I was always offered, you know, hey, there's always a place for you, for you if you if you want it. And I was in customer service at one point in time. I am admittedly I might not be great at customer service. I don't know. I also worked in retail uh at at one point in time and I was I think I was pretty good. Um and I was on track to be the youngest sales manager in Best Buy's history which was cool at the time until I hate, realized I hated the hours of retail. But at my dad's business, I was working in customer service answering the phones. And there was a particular, uh, there's a particular time that I felt would be, you know, that turned out to be integral to my future. Uh, and it was when a gentleman who called, you know, called up and apparently he had been calling up a lot, good customer and stuff. And I said, uh, thanks for calling Todd Transit. This is Jason. How may I help you? And he said, hey, got And I said, uh, thanks for calling Todd Transit. This is Jason. How may I help you? And he goes, pick up. And I said, thanks for calling Todd Transit. This is Jason. How may I help you? Well, the whole time I thought he was saying speak up, but he wasn't. He was saying pick up. And if you're in the trucking industry, a pickup is super important because that's when you pick stuff up. And <laughs> and he just wanted to tell me the details of that. And I was just getting louder and louder in the midst of all of these customer service people who had been there for years. And one lady turns to me and she says, Jason, Jason, do you need me to take that? And I was like, I think, so. I think so. And so she took it and she's like, Oh, hi, John, how you doing? And she's like, she knew the guy right out of the gate. And I was like, Oh shit, I'm, I'm never going to survive <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly got out of that. But in the meantime, I was writing software for, for my dad. I, I wrote one of the industry's first um, rating systems where you could, we, we would send out disks to people and they could load up the rating, uh, the rates on their computers. And then uh, I think I had it so we could download new rates and then you could click a button. And it would print out what's called a bill of lading. Um, but that was all when I was in high school. So that was a long time ago. Yeah. When you said disks, it sounds like this was either the very early days of the internet or maybe right before the internet started becoming a thing. It was before internet use became available. It was, it was during the times of BBSs. Maybe shortly after that, the, in, you know, quote unquote, the internet was available. People just didn't know how to use it. And you know, people didn't have email addresses and all sort of stuff. But yes, uh, yeah, I wrote a software because I knew the internet was coming. So it's interesting about your story. When I was in high school, I spent a lot of time around computers in my uh, computer network. We had about, I think, 1,400 computers for 6,500 students. And I spent so much time just like fixing problems for the teachers and ghosting, you know, and tearing them apart and, you know, fixing the networking issues, like all sorts of things that I realized before I went to college that I did not want a career in IT. And even though I, I loved hardware, I just, it wasn't a passion. I ended up working in my dad's business. He's a dentist. I worked in the front office. I did a lot of uh, calling patients to confirm their appointments, talking to insurance companies to file claims for uh, patients and you know, collecting money from people, making them feel better if like they were afraid of the x-ray machine or you know, things like that. And I loved it. I just really enjoyed talking to people. Uh, you know, like you were saying, the coworker of yours, she knew his name, like, I memorized everybody's first and last names. I could tell you like their life stories. It, it was so easy for me to to remember all of these things. So it's so interesting how we basically had the opposite kind of experience. I was terrible on the phone. I'm such a visual learner. I, I don't think I could tell you at the time that that's exactly what it was, but I need to see things to be able to make sense of them. I can hear them, but I'll just catch the gist of it. I won't catch the details, the, all the details and things like that. Like, I'll hold on to them for a little while, but my brain will forget them or file them away quickly because I'm very, very good in the overall view of what something should look like and how we're going to get there. But that that's not the, the detail work. So like, you know, when, when somebody's saying on the phone, at least, you know, when somebody's saying we're going to do a pickup from here to here, you know, with this number and that's that number and here's how many weight and skids and all this other stuff. And they're just kind of rattling it all off. Like I, I would probably be a legit, terrible air traffic controller. You know, if you ever listen to that, so it's like, you're like, I, I would crash. I'd be like, hey, guys, I'm just coming in to clear the way. I got to go. 
that's my that's my thought. Maybe I can become better at it, but I maybe I just never gave customer service on the phone enough time. <laughs> well, you know, we all have our own things. You know, I can spend ten hours a day on calls talking to people, and it doesn't bother me. I don't get like fatigue, as people would say, uh, Zoom fatigue, where some people can't handle that. So, you know, we're all we're all different, and that's why companies are are so interesting because if everybody was great at everything, then like nobody would be good at anything. So you need to have your, your customer service specialist or your sales specialist or your marketing specialist. So when did you get the idea to start your first company? I would say that my first company was way back when I was in sixth grade. I created a system to sell fish an ERP system. My friend and I were going to sell <laughs> ERP is a little bit loaded, but I created a point of sale system at least uh, to sell fish and inventory them from my friend's pond on an old IBM 286 or 386 or something. <laughs> maybe, it was, maybe even it was a 486 at the time. You know, I was, I was dreaming of business. Then I got to the point where I was like selling the ability to write code. Uh, my dad paid me to, to write code for his company before I, before I worked technically at the company. And then I was doing IT work. For some reason, I got into IT work. I thought, you know, I know computers. I can fix computers. I can help people. And so, you know, I'd run around and people pay me by the hour to fix their stuff. So after dabbling in all of these things and figuring out a lot of what I didn't care about, I was working at a, uh, they called themselves a cross-media firm. So basically it was just, hey, we do the internet stuff and we do video work and, and we do graphic design. That's what it was. We do all the design things. Name them. We do them. That company, I was a technical account executive there. So I would go in with the sales guys or a salesperson who didn't know anything about the internet. And I, because I could cross both chasms and I was good with people, I would explain to the customer what we were going to be able to do for them. And then I would write it back, go back and write a little text back and then send it off to the developers. So I was kind of a transmission between the techie people and the people people. I got tired of selling people on ideas that they didn't understand. And I thought, for the amount of effort that I'm putting in here to sell people on stuff that they don't understand, I could just do this myself. So I, with my business partner, started a heating and air conditioning distributorship online. He knew a lot about heating and air conditioning, and I knew a lot about everything else. We launched that company. October 2002, the beginning of October 2002, we had the idea for what we were going to sell over drinks one night. And by the end of October, I had written the backend systems uh, to allow him to input all the products. And I wrote the uh, point of sale system that took the orders and processed the credit cards and sent through notifications to the distributor who was drop shipping for us. We took our first order at the end of, end of October 2002. What was the hardest thing you learned from starting this company? Well, in the process of starting the company, the, the, the idea of like hard work and that type of stuff where you're going to work basically two jobs, uh, you know, programming all night and, and strategizing on the weekends and then, you know, going back to your day job in the daytime. I did that for about eight months or so uh, before I left the job I was at and gave myself a raise and started working for myself. Uh, the, I, I tend to think that a lot of people say, well, I didn't realize it's going to be quite as much hard work, quite as much pushing. But I think that for me, the lessons or one of the great lessons in that was don't take things so personally. I think I had a hard time with uh, personalities that were that I couldn't understand, couldn't manage. Uh, and so I think one of the lessons was figure out how to disagree and, and expect disagreement to come to the best solutions. I, was un I think I was unprepared for the amount of disagreement that, that would arise when you have a business partner and the idea that you just have to get through it. And you have to expect the disagreement. You know, sometimes you even have to expect heated disagreements. And and trust the process that, hey, if we can bring our best information forward and figure out what we agree to, we can do something great instead of, uh, instead of maybe uh, feeling like the point is to figure out how to not disagree or figure out how to not disagree in a heated way or something like that. You know, there were lessons uh, from other folks, too. I was, I'm reading a book. The name escapes me right now, but it's from an early, you know, early, early on Google exec talking about some of the heated disagreements that happened behind the scenes at Google. People fiercely fighting for what they believed needed to happen or didn't need to happen. I'll speak for myself, but I certainly tried to avoid heated disagreements. And I don't know that that was 
beneficial. I was just scared to be in heated disagreements. Wasn't my background. Didn't know how to function in that. So I probably would have done th some things differently. If that was a lesson to be learned, I learned that lesson or was learning that lesson. <laughs> The other lessons were just kind of like, meh, we'll, we'll figure this stuff out. <laughs> There's definitely a big difference between figuring out how to not disagree and figuring out how to come together in order to solve issues in order to move forward. I was just interviewing someone recently named Jenny, who has a background in psychology like myself. And so we were talking about how we use psychology in everyday life, especially with any stakeholders. And I feel like psychology is something everybody should learn. I spent time on uh, what's called mock trial way back in high school. So I would learn how to, you know, stand up in front of somebody and put my argument together and be able to present the argument. The thing I was always afraid of was anger. That's been with me for a long time. Anger and doing something wrong. Um, those two things. And if you put the two together, I'm afraid to do something wrong, and I'm also afraid to have somebody be angry with me about it. My mechanism is to retreat, not to engage in a healthy way, or at the time wasn't. I'm much different now. I mean, but it's been, it's been nearly 20 years since I started that company. I think a lot of that can't be taught except through experience. There's, you, you can give people pointers, you can give people uh, documents, and you can give them textbooks, and you can give them tests, but until they get themselves in that situation, there's no way, there's absolutely no way to learn the lessons. It's kind of like uh, when people look at their kids and like, you know, they finally get fed up enough with their kids' questions or whatever, and the person says, well, you'll, you'll know when you're an adult. That's an asinine thing to say to a person. It's zero help at all because they can't know. The answer is they cannot know until they're an adult. And there's no amount of telling them that they'll figure it out when they're an adult that will speed that up. You must wait until those times and go through those experiences to learn. I think one of the lessons is, for me at least, is to, and this is where I'm at right now, is to treat everything as a learning opportunity and just enjoy the journey. Quit trying to settle things all the time. If I'm looking for things to be settled, uh, then I'm likely to try and speed up disagreement. Let's, let's get this disagreement over. Let's get us to a point where we're not angry with each other. Let's get us to a point where we agree. The whole point in my, in my case would get bent around, I think, if I'm digesting my own experiences correctly. But I think it got, it got, I was looking to try and uh, minimize disagreement um, and maximize settling on things instead of looking for best ways to do things. I don't know that that's true entirely, but I do know that that is a lesson. It is a, certainly a lesson. It's a social lesson that I took from working with people of vastly differing backgrounds. Why do you think your go-to reaction was to retreat? That's what I learned as a kid. That kind of stuff is ingrained in us from a very young age. It's not something, it's not something I, thought I processed. I really didn't know it. I didn't, I didn't know that that's what I was doing. Not at the time. Do you remember anything specific? Uh, yeah. I, I, I know a story that my mom told me that I have no recollection of. My mom told me at, at one point in time, well, you know, Jason, there was this time when you got in trouble for something, something minor. Didn't even know, you know, I don't even, I don't even know what it was, but it was minor. And mom got upset with me and she told me so. And maybe hours later, as she says it, she's looking around the house for me and I'm gone. She doesn't, she has no idea where I'm at. <laughs> And uh, she's getting all worried. You know, it's to the point where it's like, where's Jason? Nobody knows. <laughs> Jason took off. And she found me under her bed. Whatever. Jason had retreated under a bed and was hiding under a bed. So that physically, metaphorically, psychologically, same thing. I don't want to get in trouble. Don't want to have somebody be angry with me. Uh, because for whatever reason, I learned the pathway. The pathway in my brain is leave, hide, hide out. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and it's, and it's funny because, you know, in my house, which is really interesting, actually, the other pathway I learned is that if people disagree, well, what's going to happen is that mom and dad are going to sit us down in the family room, you know, with me and my brother and sister and, and we're sit, we're going to sit there and talk it out. <laughs> we're, nobody's leaving that family room until we figure this thing out and then we're going to pray and then we're going to leave. And that's, and, and so it's really interesting that the two pathways exist in my mind. The only way I know how to resolve things is to talk them out. But in anger, I didn't know how to exist uh, in a point of anger. When somebody else is angry, my first path was, oh, gosh, first of all, we have to stop being angry. 
because I feel like I want to retreat. And as an adult, you can't retreat. Certainly not you know, in your own company. You can't just retreat. Not really. You can try. <laughs> and you're going to screw things up. So the answer is you just can't. You have to stay in it. And you have to figure out how to function effectively in high emotion environments. That's what I've learned over time to be able to do. Function effectively in high emotion environments or highly emotional environments, if you want to say it that way. So who is the one that said, let's sit down and talk about it in your family? Was it mom or dad? Uh, mom would lead the charge, uh, but dad was on board for sure. How do you think you learn to retreat then? I don't know. I, probably because I was a third. I was a third kid. I was the last kid. And I think some of the relationally, a lot of the arguments that were had were not between me and somebody else. It was between my brother and sister who were very close in age. So the two of them, you know, going through high school as teenagers, they, people just fight. That's the way it is. Kids, kids do that. Like my brother and I, you know, would try and beat the shit out of each other. And he would always win because he was six years older than me, you know, and, and I, he'd like lock me in. A, I mean, it's all, it was all in good fun. I was terrified, but it was all in good fun in retrospect, you know, that he, he would <laughs> stick me in the toy box downstairs and <laughs> sit on the top, you know, until I <laughs> couldn't handle it anymore. So maybe that's where I got my claustrophobia from too. I don't know. But I think I watched all of these events from the outside. I might be overthinking this, but if I had to hypothesize, I would say, well, I'm seeing arguments that happen from the outside between two teenagers and teenagers and parents. I'm not party to this, but I'm in the same space. And I don't know how to process this. So Jason, just stay out of the way. Just get out of the way. Let them do their thing. Right. And as a kid, before you're even processing, like I'm not, I wasn't consciously making these decisions, but I'm certain I was just like, oh shit, get out of there. Your brother and sister going at it. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it, you know, it wasn't anything egregious either. It's just like, it's just kids doing their thing. Yeah. I think that's probably where it developed. I know my brother and I would get into physical altercations as kids. One time, I think he was nine and I was like six or seven and he wanted to sit on the couch and I was in the spot he wanted. <laughs> right. I was playing Super Nintendo and he really wanted to be in that spot and he wanted to be playing Super Nintendo. The end result was that he elbowed me in the face and one of my teeth came out. I was a, it was a baby tooth, so whatever, it didn't matter. <laughs> So, of course, you know, I'm, I've am i got blood coming down my mouth and uh, my mom's like freaking out. Dad's at work at his office and she called him up and she's like, you know, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, no, no problem. But so, yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, any stranger to that. If, if we couple that thought, you know, in my, in my life, if we couple this thought that I, I, I see arguments, I see disagreements that I'm not, I'm not necessarily party to, but maybe I am in some tangential way. And I can retreat, I do retreat. And then I also have this creative energy and this idea that I'm, you know, as a six, six years difference between me and my brother, I'm almost like an, an older, oldest child. It's like, if I combine that with this idea of like, I could just go off and do my own thing. That's what I do. I go off and do my own thing. Why? Because they're, I don't have to argue with anybody about it. In my family, I'm the youngest, right? But there's only two of us. I never really witnessed that kind of like you did. And my parents were always very positive and encouraging and they have, they both have very high IQs and EQs. So I was very fortunate because they were always like, you know, when they tuck us into bed, like, you know, this is, you know, you have, take a few minutes, tell me anything that you're thinking, anything at all. I'm not going to judge you. I'm just here to listen and, and to love you. And uh, I was extremely fortunate looking back at my childhood, because I grew up thinking that that's how everybody lived. And when I became an adult and started interacting with other people from different countries and cultures, and especially even people in America, I realized, holy crap, like I, I thought my experience was normal. The reality is my experience is abnormal. It's in the minority. And then I was even more thankful for how amazing my parents were and in, in not physically abusing me or sexually abusing me or psychologically manipulating me in any way. Very, very, very lucky. And I think that's also helped me to be a better uh, leader and a better partner for my... Yeah, you don't have as much baggage. You're not carrying around a big tote of stuff behind you. And, and more importantly, you're not carrying around a bunch of things that you don't want, that you are afraid to look at and afraid for other people to see. There's a book called Don't Take It to Work. I don't remember who wrote it, but the book don't take it to work. And it says, 
the 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 premise of the book is that the roles that we played in our homes are the roles that we will play in our work environments. Why? Because whenever we get people together, there's always a, a father figure, like somebody who's in charge. There's always somebody who's the the uh, softy. There's always the somebody who makes the cakes for everybody. There's always the somebody who does the right. There's uh, there's always the joker, right? There's there's these roles that we learn to play in our families that we learn to play in our other environments. And then when we start to play those in those environments, we go to the model that we saw as our families. When you hit real life and you're like, oh my gosh, no, there's actually a person who didn't live with a father or lived with an abusive father. And so when I come in as an authoritarian, kind of like I say, you know, if I'm in charge of an organization, well, you know, well, who's the last person I saw in charge of something? Well, it was dad. And so if I start acting like my dad, that's not necessarily a, a model that somebody else is going to accept or understand because their dad, they hated their dad or they hated their mom or they hated the joker in the corner. Like there, there are all sorts of ways that people, like you say, they grow up. We think that that's the way the world works. Then we hit the real world. We're like, oh my gosh, that's not at all how you view things. And that, that point in time, we have to take a really advised look and say, well, do we need to view it that way? Or what, what, what's the end goal here? Do we have to figure out how to get along or do we have to figure out how to get something done? Then the two don't necessarily have to be the same. We don't necessarily have to get along to get something done. You know, I'd rather, I'd like everybody to be happy, but in the absence of being happy, let's, let's do great work. <laughs> so when did you decide to switch from being an operator to being an advisor? Let's say my first real company was the heating and air conditioning distributorship. I sold that in 2011. Near the end of that, I was thinking, okay, well, what? could we do as an organization or as individuals to do other things to it? Like how could we leverage this success into other things? And so the idea of starting other ventures, you know, had been hatched already. I, I sold that company and started the other organization, which was designed to advise and help start other companies. But why did you choose that rather than starting another company for yourself? Because I'm a really good creator. And I didn't want to operate necessarily the day to day of another company. It, I think it was a, maybe a little unadvised. I don't think I would have done it. I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't do the same thing now. But yeah, I think I. I just. I wanted to just go off and do a lot of stuff, create new things. I'm a very good creator. I've always been creating. My entire life, I've been creating stuff. You chose to help other people rather than start another company again because I guess you experienced it and you're like, well, did that. Well, I th so I started the company to help other companies. So we had strategy, technology, and communications in one house. And I thought, well, if I could combine those three things, those are the things that small and mid-sized companies are not necessarily good at. Uh, they don't have teams of people to do these things. So I thought, well, that's what I'll do. Strategy, technology, and communications. And if, and if we can put these things together in one place, then as an organization grows and it needs these things in different proportions to one another, we, we could deploy those disciplines into the organizations. My other thought was, well, we could start other things for ourselves, which was ill-advised, I think, because, and there's probably a bit of hubris in that, because I thought, well, you know, I did this once, certainly can do this again. I did one, one really great, amazing hit in a certain industry. Who's to say you could do that really great, great, amazing hit in any other industry? It took a long time. It made a lot of mistakes to get to that point. Do you want to do that all again? And so I didn't, that, that's where it takes me back to I'm a, I'm a good creator, kind of like an artist. A, a great artist, probably, I'm going to go off on a limb here, makes art and thinks, I hope somebody will buy that. Or maybe if they don't buy it, fuck them, because I like my art. That's, that might be what an artist thinks. That's a terrible business model. So as a creator of things, <laughs> hey, I'd like to create that thing. I hope somebody will buy it. That's a bad way to look at things. Look at it the other way around instead. Figure out what the market wants and then go create that. What's something I haven't asked you that you wish I would ask? <laughs> Nothing. Don't ask me more questions. <laughs> All right. I, I guess we're done here then. I'm not as an open book as one might think I am. <laughs> it's been a journey. You know, life, life is a journey. Uh, I'm at a point right now where, I, where my phrase for myself is love your journey. And that is a kindness to me. It's me speaking kindly to Jason. Love your journey. All the things that I've done, and I've done a lot of things. Uh, in fact, somebody looked at my LinkedIn profile and then watched this eight-minute video I had about me. And they said, wow, you've lived like multiple lifetimes, it seems. It's like, yeah, kind of, kind of have. 
I've done a lot of stuff and I know a lot of stuff about a lot of things. It wasn't so I could be interesting at parties. It was because I just enjoy so much learning and discovering and creating and doing stuff. And I feel like there's, there's so much out there to do. The challenge that I have then is slowing that down and sticking to something or finding out what I'm really great at. And that's been a journey. But hey, I've been on it for now 43 years on the planet. So it's coming together. <laughs> and hopefully another, at least another 43. We'll see. The world is such a big place and I'd love to see it. Which brings me back to that Coffee with Humans thing. You mentioned Coffee with Humans. And you know we talked about Coffee with Humans. Coffee with Humans is all about two strangers. They meet. We meet about eight minutes before we go live. And then I spend an hour talking internationally. And I would love to then take that on the road to go to someplace and unpack that for all the other people on the planet who will never go see that place, who will think they can't or they, or they just physically or they physically can't. I'd love to be able to explode all that while having those raw, unedited conversations with people, total strangers who can become friends. I think in the creative process, if I keep my eye on, on continually opening that door to go meet people and do things, I like that. I like re I recharge on that. Just gets me going. I get so excited. So what is something that you feel very passionate about that you want to share with everybody besides the love your journey and the coffee with humans and, and all that? I honestly, I think that's it. That's the thing that's on my mind is passion right now. Be kind to yourself. There's the world is the world's a difficult place sometimes. And if anybody's going to be kind to you, stop looking for kindness outside of yourself. Be kind to yourself, love on yourself for a while. So here's, here's a thought. People are attracted to other people who are kind. Why not just be the greatest kindness giver to yourself? Uh, because you got to live with yourself. And it's really, really hard to be lovable to anybody else unless you love yourself. It's also really hard to run an organization if you don't love yourself, if you're not kind to yourself. It's really hard to make mistakes and come back from them if you're not kind to yourself. It's really hard to uh, you know, stand out in front of people and be willing to give of yourself if you're not kind to yourself. In that whole idea of loving your journeys, love yourself in the middle of all that. I think that's a good foundation to work from. Loving myself is something that I place a very high priority on. And I tell a lot of people that I come into contact with as well, like you need to love yourself or nobody else is going to love you. And even if you love yourself, a lot of people probably won't love you. And that's okay because screw them. As long as you love yourself, that's all that matters. One of the questions that I ask every single one of the people that I uh, do a, an interview with when I go to hire them is, do you love yourself? Because of my background, I'm looking a, a lot at, you know, their body language and, you know, not just the words they use, but every the, the whole picture. The most common thing is people laugh as if like, what are you talking about? Of course I love myself. But just because they say that or do that doesn't mean they actually believe the words that they're saying. Where can people follow up with you? They can find me at, at uh, therealjtodd.com or coffeewithhumans.com. Great. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And there's one thing I say at the end of every episode, and that's entrepreneurship is a marathon not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. Thank you. 